Christmas is on the solar calendar, which means it happens the same day every year, December 25th. Easter, Passover, all those times are on the lunar calendar, which is why we have a change every year in when they happen. And so this year, the Sundays between Christmas and Epiphany are not as long as in other years. So this morning, we're reading the last part that we're going to hear right now from the Sermon on the Mount. In other years, we've had a couple more weeks of that. But next week, we're going to look at the transfiguration of Jesus, which is the last Sunday of the season after Epiphany before we begin the season of Lent. So this is our last lesson for right now from the Sermon on the Mount. This comes from Matthew's Gospel, again, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 21. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, but whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are still on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, or your no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is a hard word from the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a tough one. So I was thinking, we need a joke this morning. I'm going to tell you a joke, and it came to me the other day in traffic. Because I have learned, after 36 years out of Baltimore County and moving back, that a red traffic light is merely a suggestion. <laughs> and a yellow traffic light, eh, it's just a yellow light. There was a man who pulled up to the light as it was turning yellow, and he stopped. Well, the woman behind him went nuts. She laid on the horn. She was swearing. She was screaming at him. She was just irate. And then she looked in her rearview mirror, and what did she see but a flashing light? A police officer came up and said, ma'am, get out of the car. She said, I'm not getting out of the car. What did I do wrong? There's no law against swearing. There's no law against giving someone the finger. He said, well, you're right about that. But I saw your bumper sticker that said, follow me to church. And I saw the fish on the back of your car. And then I saw the other sticker that said, what would Jesus do? And I could only assume that the car had been stolen. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> now, you got to remember, this is after seven times at Warren Road. Seven times someone on a left turn red light went through the light. Thinking it's not quite red yet. I actually missed the light that turned green for my lane because they kept coming through the whole thing. Seven cars. So why is it that we either observe a law or don't observe a law? How many of you always observe the speed limit? Raise your hand if you can boldly say that you always observe the speed limit. Mark, you are a man alone back there. 
Well, the question with law is why do you observe the law? Do you observe the speed limit because you're afraid of getting caught, afraid of getting a ticket, or do you observe the speed limit because you think it's right and just and the good thing to do? Ticket. ticket. Okay. Some of us follow the speed limit for just that reason. That's what we're talking about today, both in Paul's letter that we read in the passage from Deuteronomy and also in what Jesus is saying. Now you have to understand, Jesus is taking his disciples up the hill and the crowd has followed. This is the same crowd, if you've been here the last few weeks or you haven't been here the last few weeks, the same crowd of people that he had healed. These are poor people. These are desperate people. They have received from him something they'd never received from anyone else, and so they are led to follow him, and they're listening. And he is saying to them that they're blessed because they're poor in spirit. They're blessed when they're grieving. He says things that don't make sense. But you have to understand how little sense what he just said would make to them. You have heard that it was written in the law, and these are Jewish folks. They know the law. He says, you've heard, you shall not commit murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with someone, you're in trouble. And if you call that person a fool, you're liable to go to hell. They had to be horrified to hear these things. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. We're talking the Ten Commandments, what everyone knew and absorbed in their relationship with God is this is what God is asking for them. This is what God is demanding and commanding them to do. You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you're already there. Some of you who are alive in the Carter administration, remember Jimmy Carter said that once, and he was never let off the hook for that for the rest of his time. It would be like getting a ticket and going to court and saying, but the speed limit was 45 and I was only doing 25. And the judge says, well, you have seen it written on the sign that it's 45, but I say to you, that's too fast and I'm giving you a fine. How would you feel if that happened? Oh, you'd be outraged. You'd be screaming like the woman in the car behind the guy who stopped for the yellow light. Or if you pick up something in the store and the price tag says $4.95 and you go up and they charge you $8.27 and you say, but wait, that's not right. And the cashier says to you, well, I think it's worth more and I'm going to charge you more. What would you do? You'd say, I want to see the manager. Jesus is contradicting, it seems, the law. Now, this is the same Jesus who just in the passage we read last week said to them, I haven't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. And as I said to you when we read that, it's about a fuller understanding of what the law is for. The law was not given to restrict. The law was not given to punish. The law was not given so God could catch at something and fry your behind. That is not why God gave the law. God gave the law so that we might know how to live better before God and with each other. It's all relational. It's all about how we are to be with each other. And it's about living life more fully. You have the choice. This is Moses speaking in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, one of the five books of the law, the Torah. You have a choice between life and death. Pretty easy choice, right? Life or death, I think. I'll go with life. You have a life, a choice between blessing and curse. Which would you choose, the blessing or the curse? But people wanted to get there by the letter of the law. They were looking at the law as if, if I do this, 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 and this, if I check these things off, that's all that's required. Jesus is saying, no, I've come to fulfill that by showing you that there is more. There is a deeper life. There is a fuller walk with God that you get when you understand why the law was given and you learn to love it, not for the sake of getting into heaven, but because it brings heaven into your life right now. You can either be right or you can be righteous. That's the choice that we're being given, right or righteous. If you're right, what does that mean? It's all on you. If you're righteous, it means you're opening yourself to the God whose presence and grace and power and mercy and love can bring us into a righteous relationship. I could put it in more earthly terms. You can be right sometimes or you can be married. Anybody, some people are saying, I know what you mean by that, right? I worked with a pastor once 
who told me that his wife's job was to load the dishwasher. And every evening he went and unloaded it and loaded it the correct way. Because he said there is a right way to load the dishwasher. I said, I would have let that happen one time. That would have been your job. He said, oh no, it's her job. They are no longer married. <laughs> you can be right or you can be married. You can be right or you can be righteous. You can be right by doing everything. You can say, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't fool around, I'm in. That's what it's about. But Jesus is saying, no, there's more to this than that. Now let's look at the divorce part of this because I don't want anyone here to think that you're condemned if you've been divorced. That's not what this passage is talking about. You have to understand that while the word of God doesn't change the context in which we hear it does. That being said, in the time when Jesus walked the earth, what could a man get rid of his wife? Get rid of his wife. She was property. What could he get rid of her for? Anything. Absolutely. If she burned his breakfast, he could put her out of the house. I am not exaggerating by any stretch of the imagination. So Jesus is saying to them, if you are divorced your wife for anything other than unchastity, that is a violation of what God is trying to fulfill. And you've heard it said that adultery is wrong, and we'd all say, yes, it's one of the Ten Commandments. But he's saying how you look at someone else is just as wrong. I took a group of teenagers and adults to Jamaica on a mission trip back in the 90s. We stayed at a place that was run by Americans, and the, the leadership had changed since the group before us had gone, and things had deteriorated greatly. But I remember they had a swimming pool, and one of the youth groups that was there with the leaders was going swimming. There was a girl about 16, and she showed up in a two-piece bathing suit. It was not obscene by any stretch of the imagination. But one of the male leaders in front of everyone else just tore her apart and said, how dare you parade yourself around here like that? You go and put decent clothes on now. She was in tears. And then he turned around to another man, and he bit his hand, and he said, whoa, I can't look at that without getting ideas. It took every ounce of self-control I had not to preach him a sermon, because what the girl was wearing was not wrong, but the way he looked at her in it certainly was. This is what Jesus is saying. It's about how you get along with each other. That's why, and the kids saw the money up here, and that's sort of all that they saw. But Jesus wants us, before we even offer a gift in the church, now this is something you're not going to hear much from a pastor. I don't want you making your offering unless you're doing it the way Jesus says, with a heart that has made peace with others. That is why I did change something when I got here in worship. I changed a couple little things. But we don't share the joy of the Lord, we share the peace of Jesus Christ. That's an act of worship that says to us here, to each other, that we will live in peace with one another. Paul, unfortunately, has to tell the Corinthian church, you have to grow up, people, because it is time to remember you don't belong to Paul, you don't belong to Apollos. Maybe I planted a seed. Maybe he watered it. But you belong to God in Jesus Christ. That is who brings the growth into us. And that is who makes peace between us. So that is how we're to live with one another. In peace, in a relationship that reflects our relationship with God. It doesn't matter how much we say we love God if we do not love God's children around us especially inside our own congregations, then we have lost what the law was given for, to bring us closer to God by bringing us closer to each other. I want you to picture a triangle, if you will, with a point at the top. Well, there's a point. It's a triangle. I was not a math major. But what happens if God is at the top of the triangle and we are the people on the side? What happens as we get closer to God? we get closer to each other. The closer we get to God, the closer we will get to each other. That's what Jesus is saying to those who followed him up the hill, those who thought they had no hope anymore. He's saying to them, God gave you the law just so you could get to God. But the way to get to God is by the way you treat each other. It's a hard lesson, isn't it? 
They must have thought he was crazy. You've heard that it was written, this, but I tell you, you got to do more than that. The passage that we read from Deuteronomy talked about being close to God. The verb in Hebrew, not that I read Hebrew, but I read the translations and I read the etymology, is closer to clinging to God, to cling. What is it like to cling? It's to hold as tightly as you can. It's to be so wrapped up with each other, like cling wrap, cling film, glad wrap. Have you ever wrestled with a piece of that? When it clings to everything but what you want it to cling to and you're trying to pull it off and it's wrapping around itself. That's how God wants us to be. God wants us to be so together that we can't even tell the difference between us anymore. And if that is how we live with God, that will flow into the way we live with each other. Because the only way the world will know who we are is how we love people. The only way the world will know about God is how we love each other. So, does your bumper sticker match your attitude? Don't put a fish on your car. Don't put honk if you love Jesus unless you're going to live like you love Jesus. Or you might be pulled over and the penalty might be a little worse than you imagine. But if you love God and you love your neighbor, you will experience a depth of life that you never had before. Your life will be blessed with joy. Your life will be blessed with peace. Your life will be blessed with the presence and the power of Christ that will light up the world. Because remember, this is the season of light. The days are getting longer. But it's not which church we go to, and in the United Methodist Church, it's not which side of the fight we're on. If we belong to God, we will prevail through the love and the power of Jesus our Christ and our Lord. Amen. I invite you.